Um, my name is Sam Samidibasu. Um, I am a senior software trainer with Tenerik, and I do apologize for being late. There was an accident on 480, which slowed me down. The last five months took us took me about half an hour or so. Um, Sam, are you guys uh, an Agnetta group here? Yes. Okay. Uh, here's my little plug before we get started. I'm sure all of you guys have heard about this, but this is your um, global .NET association. So we support all um, user groups, technical user groups, especially in the Microsoft stack. Um, and this group and a whole lot of groups in, in Ohio, Pennsylvania, we are part of this. What this lets you do is have um, support for speakers and attendees. So go ahead and register yourself and start getting the newsletters. And if you start, um, if you want to go down the path of trying to be, become a speaker, right? So try your hand at a couple of local user groups and then once you get a little bit more comfortable, INET actually supports you to go out outside of your state and travel a little bit. Um, so your uh, travel expenses are getting reimbursed a little bit, right? So keep that in mind as you um, attend more and more user groups. That's a great support community. Microsoft has similar technical support communities. All right. No, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> Okay, so like I said, I uh, work for Telerik. How many of you guys know about Telerik? And I'm here to sell you about Telerik stuff for the next two hours. <laughs> I was trying to sell you guys earlier to, uh, to my team. Now, this I'm is, trying to get them on board with uh, team polls. It's good stuff, right? I'm getting, I, I'm getting like three email, emails a week. Your, your, yeah. your sales one is just half of my company, and I don't know why we're such a small team. Uh, well, this is the only Telerik thing you'll see, and I'm not going to try to sell you on anything. Uh, just, just so you know, if you're doing web stuff, uh, XML, XAML, uh, Windows Phone, Windows 8, Silverlight, uh, we are pretty much everywhere. Uh, Site Affinity for CMS and Team Pulse uh, for project management and so on. So uh, give that a shot. Uh, a lot of our stuff is free, to, free for you to try out before you have to purchase anything. All right, so um, how many of you are XAML developers? Okay. Web. All right. Okay. Um, so we can actually go a couple of different ways. So funny story. Uh, Sam actually talked to me about two months back. I we decided on a date, and then uh, I, we were all busy, and this just kind of slipped. And then finally at 3 p.m., uh, you email me, and then uh, one of my guys in Tedrick, he emails me saying, "Hey, you're, you're speaking tonight in Cleveland." I'm like, "I am." Because I wasn't actually supposed to be here. I was uh, thankfully at the Cleveland office today, so it did work out. So um, we can do a couple of different things. If you guys want more of the web stuff, uh, if you want to know in uh, go into details of how Singular really works, see more of the jQuery type stuff, we can do that. Um, we can talk a little bit Windows Phone. We can talk a little bit about uh, Windows 8 or .NET clients, uh, console applications, because this is really nice. It works across boundaries. Um, I am not smart enough to do iOS or Android yet, but I'm trying. Um, but I can point you to things which will work on other platforms too. So, questions so far? You guys okay with what we are about to do? And this is the last thing. I'm, uh, I keep telling you I'm not going to sell you on stuff, but <laughs> this is about uh, three months of my life. But I finally got together and wrote a book. It's out on APRESS. Uh, if you're doing any kind of Windows 8 development, um, give this a shot. It kind of walks you through from getting started all the way through advanced topics like cloud augmentation and service integration and so on. So that's out on APRES now. Okay, how many of you have used Singular, heard about Singular? Some of you? Okay. Um, how many of you build applications where you have need for real-time communication? A little bit, maybe starting to. The thing is, I mean, it's, it's hard to avoid this. A lot of our applications nowadays almost demand real time. So let me pull up a few examples here. Right? So you have your Hotmail, Gmail, all your emails open. That may not be really real time, but you don't have to keep refreshing the page, right? Your emails just show up. Same with if you're following an NFL or an NHL game score, things just show up. Your social media notifications and updates. Um, 
more examples of uh, things that are almost real time are turn by turn or shooter games, right? You expect things to be real time. Uh, collaboration. I'm actually missing my uh, my little. What do you call that? Uh, it's it's fine. I, I can live without. Sure. It. This is close enough. Yeah. So uh, collaboration. Uh, you guys use Google Docs or SkyDrive, right? So near real time collaboration on the same document with multiple people on board, right? So that requires uh, real time for sure. How many of you are guilty of throwing fake progress bars? <laughs> a lot of us, right? We do this thing in web applications, or even like in some web or mobile applications, where we'll throw a progress bar on the client side. And we really do not have a clue what's going on on the server side, and we'll keep hitting the server after X number of seconds, and hopefully it finishes and hopefully we can refresh content, right? So we can do better than that. We can have almost real-time communication between the server, so we know exactly that 60% means 60% done, right? So that, that's all the... Um, use cases where real-time communication is required, and obviously like chat applications, like IM chats, right? So there is, these are just a few handful. There is no dearth of examples where we need real-time in today's world, right? And we expect that those things to work. But there are problems. The internet, or more so the web as we know it, is built upon HTTP, right? Hypertext transfer protocol. And the reason we are talking about this is we see the need for having to build real-time applications. It's just not very easy. No matter what be your technology stack, Microsoft or Java or whatever else, it's just not very easy to build real-time applications. And part of your problem or challenge lies in that, right? So it is hypertext transfer protocol. It's a request and response protocol, right? So your server, your web server, might have Oh, there's another screen over there. <laughs> yep. So your web server can have all the data stores, all the information in the world, right? It's not going to serve it up unless there's a request. Right? Simple request and response protocol. Which is part of your problem because now your client has to keep asking the server every time, hey, do you have something new for me? Do you have something new for me? Right? So we do not want that. We want to get away from the client having to ask for things. Why shouldn't the server push it down to us? It has more, like new information, right? So that's kind of what we are shooting for. And like internet uh, and web servers by default are uh, stateless. So by that I mean between multiple HTTP calls to your web server, you want your web applications to be scalable. You do not want to remember a whole lot of things about the user. You have them submit cookies or any other type of information which helps you identify and serve up the next request, right? So. That doesn't help, and your web servers are not supposed to call back your iPad applications. It's always the other way around. So we are in this consumption model for a long time. However, we have been doing the web for a long time as well, and we have learned some tricks. Right? One of the common tricks is called Ajax polling or Fedora polling. And I'll, I'll explain in a bit, and you'll notice that this is something we do a lot. And there's nothing wrong in it. So here you have a red one. That's the web server. Could be any type of server, Python, IIS, whatever. That's your web server. And the blue guy is your client, which could also be anything. Could be web, could be mobile, could be desktop, the PDF, so it doesn't matter. Some client. So the point is, at marked intervals, could be five minutes, could be one second, your application goes back up to the server to say, hey, do you, get, do you have something new? Do you have a new game score? Do you have a new chat message or something? And the server says, yes, I do, or no, I don't. Right? So we make these round trips um, on that, or after every polling interval. What's wrong with this? This works. right? This is what we do all day long. What's wrong with this? Two things. right? One is it's not um, truly real time, which means if you're the Browns, have a rare touchdown <laughs> here, right? And that one day that you're out with your phone or your tablet and you're trying to follow the game, you're not going to hear about it until the next time the polling interval hits, right? Because something happened in the middle. Also, this is okay from a desktop application. You can do as many round trips as you want. But thanks to our beloved carriers, most of our mobile phones or tablets are on um, uh, what do you call it? the capped data plans, right? So it's a whole lot of bandwidth 
because you're going up to the server every time, not really knowing for sure that there is new, something new to be had, right? So this is something we do very commonly, but just know that there are some downsides to it. The web guys among you, tell me if I'm saying something wrong, you guys are free to chip in. It's, it's a conversation, right? Okay, what else? So we have learned a little bit from that Ajax polling, and we have learned to do things a little bit. There is a technique called long polling. Same setup, client and server, but notice the difference now. So the client goes back up to the server on the first try to say, do you have something, right? And the server, instead of getting back to the client right away, simply sits on it. I'm not going to answer back unless I have something new to say. Right? So that's the, kind of, that's the point. So you will have this interval be variable based on when the server chooses to respond. Right? And this is obviously better, a little better than Ajax polling, because one, you're not wasting a whole lot of bandwidth, and two, the server hopefully can get to the client the moment something interesting happens. Is this the holy grail? Does this solve everything? Do you see downsides with this? So holding a, uh, so holding a, or having to open a, <coughs> a new connection every time, so you have the, the overhead of, uh, you know, yep, yep, TCP yep, exactly. So two problems. One is based on how you uh, code your client application. Your client application <coughs> is timeout, literally timeouts, since it's waiting for too long. So you have to make sure your client application handles that. And two, is on the server side, which is what you were saying, you cannot have threads that are simply sitting on a request and waiting for something to happen, because that's just bad processing load. And your web application is just not going to be very scalable if you just keep threads hanging or waiting forever. So there are ways to get around that in like certainly not that 4.5, you can assign them to like lowest of ports and not really have computational cycles waiting on it. Uh, but the point is, this takes a little bit of orchestration both on the server and the client side. Right? Yes, sir. Are we breaking the stateless rule when we do that, though? Or is that not a rule we care about? No, well, all of these calls could be stateless. The server is not really remembering things about each client. It's just remembering things about that last request and waiting on it. It's an HTTP request, let's say an HTTP GET request. The server simply doesn't respond immediately. So it, 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 but it's, re it's, remembering it's remembering about that time. particular yes. one, which yes. one it is. Yes. And, and what, you just have a limited time of remembering and then you just forget it? Well, you can have, yes, you can have that on the server side too, like after 10 minutes or one minute, you just forget about it and just say, I don't have anything new. You can do that too. Right? So it all depends on your client and server application on how you code things up, what your timeout limits are. Right? So, that's why I'm saying it, it, it is a little better, but it needs a little orchestration on, on both sides. You could use a plugin, right? How many of you do Silverlight or Flash development type stuff or it? I'm sure you use it, if, if you, even if you don't know for it. So Flash was Adobe's big thing back in the 90s, I would say. And then Microsoft came up with Silverlight to kind of fight it off and do media better. And they're both the same type of techniques. It's a plugin that runs inside your browser, right? Now, each of these plugins have their own way of doing web sockets, their own implementation. So you could, um, in theory, have a web socket communication between a client and server, right? And have that communication through that web sockets. And I'm not an expert on this, but I can um, hopefully point you to some Silverlight stuff where you can write a chat application in like 20, 25 lines of code. It's not much, right? but it's it's their implementation. Now the downside of this is the industry as a whole is moving a little away from plugins, right? For good or bad, Steve Jobs didn't like Flash, and he had his reasons. Apple has his reasons, and since then, since iPads and everything else has gotten so popular, Flash is, in my opinion, it's a little on the downside in terms of overall technology. I mean, it's, we are still doing Silverlight development, but even like Silverlight, from Microsoft standpoint, it's uh, it, it's funny when you ask like Silverlight MVPs, like, "Hey, when is Silverlight Six coming out?" <laughs> and they just like smile at you and don't really <laughs> reply. So who knows? But I mean, Silverlight Five has like a ten-year 
uh, support system. So it's not going away anytime soon. But overall, plugins is something we are trying to move away from. This is the holy grail, if it does work. So um, I don't know how many of you do HTML5 type web development, the, the latest cutting edge stuff. I'm not an expert on this, but there is something called WebSockets, which is an HTML5 standard, right? And that allows you to not use any plugins and simply HTML or HTTP communication between the client and server, but have native implementation of WebSockets on your browser and on the server side, right? Why is it the magic thing? Don't work. Because when it works, it's beautiful. <laughs> you just need a web server, just need a browser, and it's just going to start working. But there are some conditions. There are lots of conditions that need to be true before that will start working. And hopefully by the end of today, um, at 7 o'clock, you guys here till 8.30. Really? Not 10.30 or 11.30? We are needed. OK. All right, so hopefully we'll show you, uh, I'll get to show you some WebSocket stuff. Uh, but the point is, it needs a modern web server. It needs, on the Microsoft stack for ASP.NET applications, it needs IIS 8 before this will start working. And it needs a modern browser. It needs Chrome, um, I don't know, from some point forward. And it needs IE 10, right? So you're not going to get this in like backward compatibility a whole lot. But when it does work, it's good. There are two other techniques, and these are not very commonly used, but it, it's good to mention these things. So there is a thing called uh, forever frame. This is commonly used in IE. How many of you deal with iframes or have dealt with iframes? And you don't want to go. And you don't want to go back, right? It's not so, <laughs> yes, it's not nice, but it does work. This is particularly true for IE type browsers, where the point is you'll have a hidden iframe on the client side, and you will keep injecting JavaScript from the server down to the client. And hopefully that JavaScript does some polling back to the server or some other technique that you use within that pushing down of JavaScript to have that communication between the client and the server. WebKit type browsers use something called server sent events. Um, I think YouTube was using this at a, at a point of time. So a lot of media streaming sites uh, use this. And this is more of a server to client communication than the other way around. It's, uh, it's, it's using something called HTTP chunking, where you make an HTTP request to me, the server, and I say, here's your response, and by the way, I didn't give you the whole thing. I'll give you bits and pieces of it, right? So that's what the media streaming sites use to keep pushing down content to your browser, to your client, right? So why am I talking about all of these things? So the last slide and this slide hopefully gives you a feel that there are a lot of different technologies that we can use to go and build real-time applications, right? There is no real good answer. You just pick the one that works for the type of application that you're trying to build. Make sense so far? Everyone with me? No one's sleeping, which is really good. Okay. What is SignalR? SignalR is an asynchronous signaling library for .NET applications, and we'll, we'll explain the .NET part of it a little bit. But the point is to make it easy for you to build real-time applications on the .NET stack. And it doesn't have to be everything on the .NET stack, and we'll talk about that. What we are shooting for is to get away from that request-response thing. You have seen that it's not nice, because somebody is waiting on the other person with the request-response. So we want the client and the server to have a persistent connection always, right? If networks drop, we'll try to reconnect and so on. But the point is, if there is a persistent connection, a channel, then we can talk either way at any time, right? And that's what we're shooting for. So what SignalR will try to do is actually not do anything magical or reinvent the wheel. It will use any of the five or six techniques that we saw before. It just doesn't tell you what it's going to use. Right? So it just abstracts away the transport layer. So you can focus on building your application, your real-time application. Right? There are two, I know, actually know these guys personally, they're great, fantastic, and really sharp folks. There are two guys on the ASP.NET team, Damien Edwards and David Power. Um, and they're funny because Damien is from Australia and David is from Barbados. So they have uh, conflicting accents, and it's, it's just funny when they present something together. 
but they're great guys. <laughs> they were working on a completely different problem on their nights and weekends, and they came up with this encapsulation thing um, way back, like a year, or a year and a half, or almost two years back now. But they started out doing SQL R as an open source thing, and it, it is still open source. I'm sure the GitHub repository where it lives. But since then, it has been making a lot of progress to the point where Microsoft has sat up and taken taken notice that oh, this is something really nice, right? So. Um, to your pointy-haired bosses or whoever else is uh, a little nervous about using new technology, ASP.NET now uh, includes Signal R as a part of the family. So the whole one ASP.NET family, if you are building MVC3, MVC4, MVC2 apps, Signal R is just like using anything else within the templates, right? So it is built in. So you will have Microsoft support starting, I think, February of this year, where they, like, the official support kicked in. So if you have trouble, you can actually raise tickets, and it's a different question that tickets take forever to like figure out. But the point is, this is no different than using anything else in the ASP.NET stack. It's, it's built in. So here are a few places where you can go and learn about it. <coughs> also have a little fun. See that github.signalr uh, slash signalr? That's the official repository. It still is for the source code. So if you want to see what they're doing, and if you're brave enough to play with it or muck, it, muck around with it, you can go ahead and download that, and you can tweak it to your heart's content. If you have suggestions on something that they can do better, they're actually taking community um, feedback as well, so you can make a pull request. If they like what you're doing, they'll get you in. Right? But you're going to be really good before they do that. Um, so let's show you a few other things. 